Okay, so hi everyone, I'm Walt, and uh, uh, let's go ahead and meditate for about 15 minutes or so, maybe 20 minutes, and uh, then we'll have a short talk and possibly a discussion if we have time. So um, go ahead and find a comfortable upright posture, sitting, if you're sitting in a chair or on a cushion, if you're lying down, just um, do what you can to not fall asleep. <clears throat> I like to say sit, sit with a sense of dignity and purpose, kind of like the Buddha under his Bodhi tree. And you might take a deep breath or two here at the beginning, just as a way to more fully arrive here in this present moment, in this body. And noticing there is this body sitting here. You might feel the contact with the chair or cushion, feel the feet, feel the hands. This is our opportunity to become more embodied so that we're not just in the control tower up in our heads. You might notice any tension in the body. You can easily soften around or release. I usually start at the top of the head and do a scan down relaxing the muscles in the face, softening around the eyes, loosening the jaw, making sure we're not clenching the teeth, dropping the shoulders, relaxing the arms, softening the belly. Relaxing the legs. And with sound, we're aware of sounds arising and passing away. We Kind of let them be in the background for now. If it's useful, you can use the breath as an anchor, something to return to when the mind wanders, which it naturally will. As we breathe in, we know we're breathing in. As we breathe out, we know we're breathing out. And a lot of meditation is settling, landing in the body, letting distractions fall away. We practice with a sense of kindness for ourselves, kindness for the world. A sense of gratitude can be helpful too, helps settle the mind. 
it's good to think of just a few things we can be grateful for in this moment. Uh, it can be very simple. I'm grateful to be breathing today. We're grateful for the technology of Zoom to help stay connected to this kind of Buddhist recovery community. Grateful to Ann for letting Walt know he was supposed to be on the call. <clears throat> Whatever it may be. You might check in, just notice if you're lost in thought with stories or plans. See if you can let those go just for now. Come back to the next in-breath or out-breath. Feel the weight of the body on the chair or cushion, the contact, a sense of gravity, gravity's pull. Sometimes it's even helpful to label thoughts if they're persistent. Um, like you can just label them planning, planning if you're thinking about what you're going to do later today or this weekend or something. And then hopefully the labeling helps us let it go. We can come back to it later when we're not meditating.
Okay. So hopefully, um, welcome back when you're ready. And uh, again, my name is Walt. Uh, Kevin's out of town, I think out of country even. Um, and I've uh, filled in for Kevin lots of times over the years. Uh, he mentored me in the Spirit Rock Community Dharma Leaders Training Program quite a few years ago. And uh, I've been in recovery since 1987, so just hard for me to believe. Um, anyway, uh, and I'll offer a little talk here. So last night, a friend of mine uh, who's a, I went through a teacher training recently through uh, Insight, Insight Meditation Society to be a retreat teacher. And um, one of the people I was in the training with texted me last night and said they, they were um, teaching retreat and had been asked to give a talk on Mudita, Appreciative Joy, which is one of the Brahma Viharas, the divine abodes. The, the, they are loving kindness, compassion, appreciative joy, and equanimity. Uh, and these are th qualities that, uh, like they're called the divine abodes. They're kind of wholesome, very positive um, qualities that we can cultivate in our practice. To, um, and you, you hear the most about metta or loving kindness. That's kind of the first one. It all kind of starts with that. And uh, then the second one, compassion, is uh, I've heard it described as where the loving kindness meets suffering. So it's kind of like caring about other people's suffering. And then the third one that I was going to talk about today, appreciative joy or sympathetic joy, is when that same loving kindness meets uh, the joy of others or the successes of others. So I think this is a beautiful one for recovery in a way, because like if you go to a recovery meeting, um, I was reflecting, uh, like there was, you know, I love speaker meetings because <laughs> you kind of hear the arc of people's story. And I remember a woman, I went to a pretty big speaker meeting in downtown Oakland. And this woman just shared such an incredible story arc of her sort of downfall in addiction and then, rec you know, her recovery process. And it went from being, you know, on the streets, uh, selling her body, selling drugs, selling whatever, to then getting into recovery and then slowly, you know, putting life together. And then at that point, she just had, she looked so vibrant and uh, successful, even had some kind of great job and was wearing like a power suit or whatever. But it was just such an amazing, and I just remember feeling so much what we could call appreciative joy or, or mudita is the poly word for that woman's like, what an amazing story and very inspiring. And so um, this is, I heard this called the, the lazy person's shortcut to enlightenment, something like that. that just by uh, taking the opportunity to cultivate joy at other people's success is kind of like um, the easy way to feel some, some kind of, I don't know if enlightenment's the right word, but uh, something positive. In the Dalai Lama, even, there's a quote um, from the Dalai Lama. It only makes sense to cultivate happiness. This is him talking. It only makes sense to cultivate happiness for the happiness of others, because then you increase your own chances of happiness six billion to one. Um, he's, he obviously said that quite a while ago, because I just read literally this morning that in November, we will have 8 billion people on the planet now, instead of six. <laughs> so we're up to 8 billion, which is pretty shocking, really. But um, I don't even know how to wrap my head around that idea. <laughs> um, 
but so yeah, that really increases our odds if we can um, if we can uh, cultivate happiness from the happiness of others. So that's one way to look at this quality. Um, the it's sometimes it's called uh, a altruistic joy uh, as well. Uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi defines it as the feeling of happiness at the success and good fortune of others, and the near a near enemy is worldly happiness, which I guess would come from, you know, uh, having lots of stuff that we always wanted or whatever, and so we think we're kind of happy, but it's based on sort of selfish means, um, and this is decidedly an unselfish quality. It's really about appreciating others as much as anything. Um, and then the opposite of this quality is envy, jealousy, uh, which makes sense. And then another one is discontent, that there is uh, in some of the Buddhist texts, the I, there's this idea that uh, this counter counteracts discontent, that if we can really appreciate others um, and cultivate some sense of gratitude, maybe for having those people in our lives or whatever it is, then we're much less likely to be discontent, uh, which is an interesting idea. Uh, let's see. And, you know, um, many of us suffer from the, the dukkha, the pain of comparing mind. <laughs> Maybe you've never done this, but, uh, <laughs> you know, we have this tendency to compare uh, ourselves with others, you know, you probably heard that we're really we we're comparing the outsides of the other people with our own insides a lot of the times and things like that. But it, it, at any rate, um, comparing mind, as we call it, is just very painful a lot of the time because we tend to somehow find that we fall short. Or even if we think that we're somehow better than other people, that's not such a great feeling really either. Um, so there's Ajahn Pasano. Um, I know Kevin really likes Ajahn Pasano. And he uh, wrote, he's written on this quality. The other interesting thing about this particular quality of mudita, um, oh, can you hear me all right? So yeah, just we can we can hear just I don't know if it's possible to um, someone has just let me know that they had a hard time. All right. But I don't know if you can get a little closer. Okay, yeah, sure. I, was, yeah. I actually have this giant microphone. So <laughs> I thought usually it's pretty good. <laughs> but my voice is kind of low. People, uh, my mother in law used to have a really hard time hearing me. <laughs> um thank you yeah sure okay so i was just gonna say i had a little quote a little bit to read from ajahn pasano he's a monk in the uh, thai forest tradition um he says the quality of mudita gladness sympathetic joy is not mentioned specifically in the uh, discourses suttas as often as loving kindness and compassion mudita um is an antidote for jealousy, envy, for the tyranny of the self. So it's kind of a way we get out of ourselves. The way we relate to others is governed largely by our attempts to prop up a feeling of self-worth, he says. So much of our interaction with others is in terms of comparison, and therefore feelings of intimidation or inadequacy are factors in our relationships. Mudita cuts through these feelings and allows us to have a sense of joy with whatever we experience around us. Cutting through self-view is the Buddha's unique contribution to spiritual practice. That's an interesting statement. Cutting through self-view is the Buddha's unique contribution to spiritual practice. Mudita is antithetical to the self-view that we carry around with us and leads us to a place of boundless and immeasurable joy, hopefully. To be able to rejoice in the acquisitions or success of others is the antithesis of what is the norm in a modern competitive society. We seem to be habituated to finding fault or criticizing as our default option. 
Mudita gives us the opportunity to direct attention to something that makes the heart much more expansive. So I just thought that was um, nicely put. And there's, there really isn't as much writing about this quality as one might have thought. <laughs> so uh, um, I thought that was worth sharing the whole thing. And I, it's interesting because my I have a young daughter and you know this whole competitive thing comes up a lot and we actually have her at a Waldorf school which is very much about not being competitive but nonetheless the kids are still gonna they still compare everything <laughs> and uh, you know right now it's like comparing summer camps <laughs> to or it can be so many different things and so we're constantly working with her on this like it doesn't have to be a competition <laughs> I find myself saying that uh, over and over. And because it, this this idea that everything's a competition that's part of our modern world seems to just cause nothing but suffering a lot of the time, um, I don't really see the benefit. And so I think this is a wonderful quality for us to contemplate and cultivate. And it's interesting because Ajahn Amaro, another uh, monk that he and Ajahn Pasano, who I just read his passage, they, um, they at one time they were co-abbots of a Bayagiri monastery up in Northern California. But anyway, so Ajahn Pasano has a little book on this quality. It's, he wrote four, he has four little books, one for each of these uh, qualities of the Brahma Viharas, the divine abodes. But what's interesting about this is he talks about the cycles of addiction as related to this particular quality, <laughs> which uh, I only remembered last night when I just happened to look, look at this. So um, he says, when the mind gets caught in the feeling of pleasure, there is the tendency to want more of it. Or when the mind experiences an unpleasant feeling, painful feeling it wants to get away from it. This is what is called the bridge between feeling and craving. Uh, this is the key point in the addictive process because this is where the trouble really starts, where the feeling of like transforms into I want and the feeling of dislike turns into I can't stand or I can't bear it. Um, so I don't, I'm not going to read all of this, but um, this is one of my favorite topics and I just think it's fascinating that he's bringing it in under in his book on mudita so um, I think part of this quality is uh, cultivating a certain contentment with uh, with things as they are so that we're not craving for some different experience and we're not craving uh, for all, all, you know, pleasure or try to push things away so much. Um, and there's different ways we could cultivate this. Um, I really think just going to 12-step meetings and hearing other people's or any kind of recovery meeting where people are kind of sharing, you know, the idea what it was like, what happened, and what it's like now, that kind of trajectory allows us to kind of feel mudita when, when we hear these sort of success, recovery success stories. So I think that uh, in a way it's built into the recovery world. I also think, you know, in sponsorship, when we're, when we're sponsoring somebody and we help them through difficult times and we see them sort of come out the other end of that and they're doing better that creates a certain uh, natural mudita um, and so that's kind of easy to do in the recovery world but in the regular world we may not always do that because when other people are successful it can seem harder to be happy for them uh, Sharon Salzberg who has written quite a bit about this uh, topics. Uh, she's one of the, probably the main people worth checking out uh, if you're interested in this topic, who's written a fair amount. Her name's 
I'll put it in the chat. Sharon Salzberg just spelled her home. Uh, so she says, rather than witnessing someone's success or good fortune and falling sway to the voice that so often arises within us, which says, ooh, I wish you didn't have so much going for you right now. You don't have to lose everything, but I'd rather I'd be rather pleased if the light could just dim a bit. <laughs> we actually can be happy when someone else is happy. We don't need to feel that their happiness is taking something away from us. We can recognize that their happiness is our happiness and feel at one with them in that way. So yeah, it's that feeling of lack that I know I've had <laughs> for a lot of my life and fortunately not doesn't seem I do feel like I've worked through a lot of that where somehow if somebody else is getting theirs we feel like there's not going to be enough for us to get ours <laughs> for us but it, the universe is quite abundant actually <laughs> we just don't always seem to uh, operate that way and um, the one of the things that I kind of came up with in my recovery at some point was this phrase let yourself be blessed and i started just um that was like a mantra let yourself be blessed so when something positive because i also felt like if something positive was happening happening for me that either i didn't deserve it or somehow it was going to get ruined <laughs> it wasn't really going to come all, come through all the way i didn't trust it and so i had to start saying let yourself be blessed uh, that it was okay for me to have positive things happen and that actually was useful as well um, just took the comparing mind away and just allowed myself to be blessed and uh, Sharon talks about uh, I think this is an interesting point uh, that you know when you receive sympathetic joy from others and when you don't when someone is happy that something great happened for you, their delight in your good fortune feels like such a tremendous gift. Then there are times when something really good happens for you and the other person may look at you and smile, but you get the feeling they would be just fine if it all went away. <laughs> and that feels terrible that they somehow feel bad because of your happiness, your good for fortune. And so I think it's a nice way to that she's reversing it because it's like we can all probably relate to that when we've had some good news and shared it with somebody and they've been genuinely happy for us and it's so nice to be met in that way and then times when somebody said they were happy for us but you felt like they were kind of half-hearted about it so likewise we want to offer that more supportive appreciative joy to the people in our lives so that they don't have that that sort of terrible feeling that that we don't really support them in that moment um, so just to you know it's a way to feel what it would be like those two different versions here what it's like to receive them um, so yeah it's it is a it's a tremendous gift that we can give others in our lives when we can appreciate them um, I came across um, there's a sutta where the Buddha comes the I was reading an article um, from Sharon Salzberg that it, it, it was a tricycle magazine article uh, let's see so if you google it you'll find it um, let's see so the Buddha came across some monks and they were living together and in harmony and uh, they described it as that they were blending like milk and water looking at each other with kindly eyes and uh, Venerable Analia, another one of my teachers says once metta or loving kindness by way of the three doors of action bodily verbal and mental uh, has led to the absence of quarreling, the actual dwelling in harmony and mutual appreciation could then be seen as an instance 
of this Brahma Vihara of sympathetic joy that we're talking about. So that so that it um, to me the interesting point here is it wasn't just a quality that he wanted people to develop while they're meditating or something that he really wanted people to live and practice appreciative joy with each other, that his monastics in particular, uh, but I think any of his followers, he would have said the same thing, but that it was a, a, a lived practice that he wanted to see where people were living in harmony together, uh, looking at each other with kindly eyes. And when they're actually able to do that genuinely, then that is kind of living this Brahma Vihara. Um, I, he also, let's see. Yeah, so I just, um, another thing I wanted to share, there's a book called How We Choose to Be Happy by Rick Foster and Greg Hicks. And uh, if you're familiar with James Barras, who wrote a book on joy, uh, he's a Dharma teacher. He kind of wrote, what's the name of that book? <laughs> Get something joy awakening joy he wrote a book called awakening joy and he loves this book how we choose to be happy and so these guys talk about appreciation and how really happy people are really good at appreciation um and i mean this i'm i'm t talking about this really for my own because i'm not great at this <laughs> so i'm uh, this is a, a quality i'm cultivating still you know it's something where i could definitely improve but they, they have a little intro about appreciation, and I think this is an aspect of mudita. Uh, appreciation is many things and assumes many forms, they say. Appreciation is transformation. It is awareness. It's how we, rec how we acknowledge others. It's the way we open our emotional floodgates and let our happiness flow into the world. And appreciation is our way of living fully in the moment. That's really interesting. That it's like, and they uh, they say with appreciation we move mountains. We can take what is ordinary and turn it into something special. We can elevate a friendship into a great relationship, disarm a business adversary, make a crisis more bearable, balance sadness with beauty. How you might ask, by seeing that there what there is to appreciate in any situation. So I like that it's kind of like we're going around looking for where we can shine our appreciation beam, <laughs> light beam. Um, and that is a very different way to be in the world, <laughs> as you can probably imagine. And I'm, uh, this is definitely something that, you know, we don't have to do it perfectly, or it's just something that we could start to cultivate in our lives a little more. Um, I was in couples counseling for a long time with my wife and uh i the therapist often said that we just needed to appreciate each, appreciate each other more uh that that she even pointed out that we a lot of times we we were agreeing like whatever we were saying would sound like an argument but this is why a therapist is great <laughs> or a third party who's a has an objective view she's like you're both basically saying the same thing but you sound like you're arguing <laughs> and it was so helpful to hear that it's like oh we actually agree <laughs> we just for some reason are arguing anyway um so that did help diffuse that a bit and and the more that uh that i think both of us can appreciate each other it's like we do live in more in harmony and when we get away from that there's less harmony. You can kind of feel it. Um, and, you know, it's really about some other words that are thrown around for this quality are rejoice, rejoicing, or gladness. Sometimes mudita is called gladness. Um, so you can see it's, uh, it resides, it's about being unenvious. Um, is the way it's put into the Sudhi Maga, which is a um, famous uh, Buddhist commentary text. <laughs> and it helps eliminate uh, boredom, 
which is also interesting. So it makes sense, because if we're appreciating things, then we're not bored, right? So uh, if you're bored, then maybe you need to bring in some additional mudita into your life, <laughs> if you're finding boredom. Um, so really, we're running out of time. Maybe I'll stop here. Thank you for listening. <laughs> And I'll just uh, briefly, we don't have a whole lot of time left, but I'm happy to take any questions if people have any about what I said, just to help clarify anything, or if you have any questions or comments. We can take a few extra minutes here. Hi, Walt. <clears throat> it's Anne. Hi, Anne. Hi. Oh, I appreciate you showing up. <laughs> This was wonderful, but I love this topic too. It's many, many faceted. Um, the part w where you mentioned, um, allow me, allow myself to be blessed or may I, may I appreciate the blessings of my life, I guess, something like that. Oh, no, that's, yeah. Kevin, that's Kevin's phrase. Yeah, I just thought of that. Yeah, and um, I think that's something that, and maybe these two go hand in hand feeling truly feeling appreciation for another's success and learning to appreciate my own what's my own goodness my own blessings the things that or the qualities or the in my life right i think maybe the more i don't know they work synergistically but i feel like in the last few years i've felt more and more um more energized around appreciative joy you know for others for mudita and and maybe that's reflected in my own capacity to to really sink in, let sink in the, the joys of my life. You know, I mean, Rick Hansen talks about really marinating in the good, you know, like when something good is happening to you or in your life, um, that it creates, it sort of solidifies the neural pathways. Yeah, I mean, it's a lot of climbing uphill. <laughs> you know, to get to that place in recovery where, you know, happiness and freedom is, you know, a lived experience more and more. It's exciting. It's fun. So thanks. Thank you for, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Anne. I mean, yeah, when I was in early sobriety, I was really negative. You know, I just had cultivated being negative so well over so many years that it took a lot of time to like you say it was a very uphill battle to get to this uh, point of real mudita and i think i guess we have self-compassion so i guess why not self sympathetic joy <laughs> you know i think that it's funny it's not something i've seen written about much but uh, it makes sense to me especially for recovery folks i think we might need that because <laughs> um you know, like I said, we were just very good at being negative. For I was like a walking negative vortex for a while there. <laughs> um, I mean, in college they called me schlep rock, which was which I hated, <laughs> but but uh, which was the guy that was a dark cloud over him in, in the Flintstones, who would always everybody's having a great time, and schlep rock would come in with this dark cloud and kind of uh, pee on everybody's parade or whatever. So I'm afraid that was me, apparently. <laughs> uh, hopefully not always. But uh, all right. Well, thank you, Anne. I really do appreciate you uh, finding me. <laughs> uh, I didn't even know what day it was, honestly. <laughs> it's just in a weird uh, the summer months or something. All right, any other questions or comments, or should we go ahead and end? Well, thanks everyone for your attention and um, good to see everyone and have a good day and go out, go forth and appreciate others <laughs> and including yourselves. <laughs> <laughs>